All right, so thank you for having me. Um, I'm Lucas. I also work at Leap, but I'm also since last summer part of the founding team of the company WittyWorks. Um, and this company actually focuses on increasing diversity uh, in, in IT, but also in generally in the workplace. So we offer consulting services and we're also building some tools to help uh, improve diversity. Um, all right, so let me get into the talk and uh, I'll start off with a short video here. Yeah, so I just wanted to show this video to kind of illustrate what our industry is producing right now. Um, and the lack of diversity is, of course, a big impact there, or a big reason why this is the case. I mean, so we can, I think we can safely call this soap dispenser racist. Um, now, are the creators of this soap dispenser racist? I don't know. I, I guess they didn't care enough, right? Um, they didn't, didn't even consider to, uh, to look for different skin complexions to make sure that their device actually works. Right? Um, so I think probably they weren't racist, but essentially by not caring, they did something, uh, they created a racist machine, right? So if you want to be light about it, it's accidental uh, racism uh, in a way. Um, but it is, you know, the reality that people are uh, of, the, of, you know, non-light skin complexion face instead of machine is being racist. Um, so they, the, the engineers simply did not think about testing it with different skin complexions. Um, and so what should the engineers do when, you know, the internet has pointed this out to them now, right? Um, the internet told them they created a racist machine. What should be their reaction? Um, and the interesting thing is that most of the time when people are faced with, um, you know, with the offensive actions they've done, intentional or non-intentional, they become defensive. So they're going to say, yeah, we didn't have enough budget or some other excuse. Um, but honestly, to the people affected, that's not a valid excuse, right? Um, so obviously they should fix the problem. Uh, I don't know if the soap dispensers is patchable, um, but they should fix. But most important, they should make sure something like this doesn't happen again. Um, and that still doesn't make it fine, but that's at least some progress, right? Um, but I actually think that if you look at, um, you know, these types of accidental racism, um, I think it, it illustrates quite well that um, you don't have to be intentionally racist to cause problems. And in, in turn, you actually need to educate yourself on the topic. And I want to give an example. I'm part of the symphony community. Um, and uh, we had a case, I think not quite as bad, but, but also problematic, where this case happened for several years. And only when I started to care about the topic of diversity, um, I, I started to look at it and actually noticed. Um, so this is how this, we had a badge system, uh, or we still have a badge system in Symphony. So whenever you join the community, you get badges. When you, you know, commit some code, you get another badge. If you attend a conference, uh, you get another badge. And so if you registered for this badge system, the first badge that you got was the Hey Dude badge. Right? And this had been there for several years, right? And I never considered it to be a problem. I didn't even see that there was a problem, right? But it, I only noticed it actually on the, the conference presentation 
because we had, uh, we had an, also an award which said, thanks, dude. Um, and I was at this, um, you know, uh, at this conference, we were just presenting this award, and next up was me getting introduced as the lead for the diversity initiative. So in that moment, finally, I had the hat on of somebody that thinks about diversity. And then it was blatantly obvious, right? Hey, dude, it's not okay. Excludes half of the world's population, right? So we fixed it. You know, it's now hey, you. Um, I mean, it, it, it does the same thing for half of the population, but it changes everything for the other half of the population, right? And so again, we were just careless, and therefore I would actually argue accidents like this are a problem. It's and we should care. We need to actively do something. And that's kind of what I want to aim with with this, with this talk, is that we choose where we care and where we don't care. And it was interesting, uh, I was talking to Geoffroy, like, or, you know, I was sitting here, Geoffroy came in, and we said hello, and it was kind of awkward because we were pondering if we're going to shake hands, you know, because currently with the virus going around, right? So something like a behavior that is so normal for us to shake hands, and within a few weeks, suddenly, we can change our behavior, right? But so many things about diversity are so incredibly hard to change. For years and years, people say it's too hard to change. Uh, it's uh, too hard to say to stop saying guys if you're addressing a mixed gender group, um, um, because you know it's you know guys. Yeah, um, I guess it's fine, you know, um, and women use it as well like this, right? But we feel it's too hard, right? And I think we just need to start caring and. Um, and actually investing some of our energy into this. So the other thing that I want to make sure is that, um, uh, or what I want uh, people to take away from this talk is that whenever you are faced with feedback where you did something offensive, again, it doesn't matter if it's intentional or non-intentional, is that you listen, you learn, and you move on. It's, there's, you, it's not a moment where you need to explain yourself, right? If you did something offensive, in that moment, that person needs to be assured that you are not going to do it again, right? And if you're going to say, yeah, but, you know, I got off on the wrong foot this morning, that's not going to assure them um, that you're going to stop doing it. So maybe personally, again, like I always thought that I wasn't part of any of these problems, right? I'm a nice person. I always try to do my best, right? Um, and I, I, I thought that just being a nice person, eventually, when, if we all become nice people, then the problem will fix itself. Um, but I finally realized that, um, and this is mostly, my wife is an engineer, and just listening to the realities that she's faced in, in she works in a factory setting, um, I realized that things are even worse than I thought, right? Um, she is subjected to blatant sexism, right? Like her boss told her, no, she cannot advance because for this position they need a man. And they didn't use the exact words, but it was pretty close to these words, right? It's, it's not even like hinted. Um, um, you know, she's being told to take the notes because women have nicer handwriting and stuff like that. And there I realized we're so far away from a place that is diverse or inclusive that it's not enough to just be nice, right? I need to become active. Um, so really, that's also what I, I hope with this talk, is that everybody, in different situations, everybody's part of the dominant group, right? So, um, so for example, women are the dominant group if you look at the nursing industry, right? And maybe male nurses are being marginalized there, right? So it's not a possibility. Um, and so, so we are all, in some cases, we are in this position of power and privilege where we can either include people or exclude people um, or where we can ignore the fact that some people are being uh, excluded or we can actually actively do something. So um, some definitions, I'll, I'll have a few slides like this. So when I talk about diver diversity, I'm talking about the, the presence of differenceness in a specific setting. And differenceness can be many things and this is not an exhaustive list. So it can be ethnicity, gender, age, religion, um, any of these things. Um, so this is what I talk about with diversity. 
Um, let me give you some more examples, and I will not dwell on this too much, but why it also is a good, there's, there's good interest in this in terms of business. So those, those soap dispensers, I hope they're not selling anymore. Um, so I hope that this was actually financial damage. Um, now let's look at the, the Apple Watch. Um, so this is, this is how uh, Tim Cook introduced the Apple Watch. So he said, this is a new intimate way to communicate from your wrist and a comprehensive health and fitness device, right? And um, what's kind of puzzling is that, so in the first version that of iOS that was bundled with, uh, with the new Apple Watch, it didn't cover period tracking, right? So actually period tracking as a form of tracking time predates time, right? So this is the, the oldest form how time has ever been tracked is by period tracking, right? And it is not included in this intimate health and fitness tracker device, which is something that almost half of the population is affected by, right? It's just not included. Um, it also doesn't require sensors, right? You don't need a sensor beyond just time, right? So they have fancy heart, tra heart rate tracking. You know, they added sensors, but not this trivial feature. Now, Apple Watch Series 2, um, they also released an iOS update, which included period tracking. And if you look at the adoption rates, um, then they made a clear jump with female users with the next version, right? It's not, you know, it's from 20 to 26, um, so, but it's a significant thing. And I don't have final proof of it, but I would say there's a correlation between added period tracker features. And uh, this article here talks about this puzzling jump and they don't come to the conclusion that period tracking could have anything to do with this, right? So the, the, the journalist there is also totally oblivious to m what could maybe be needs of, uh, of female customers. So what I'm saying is basically, if you don't have diversity, you're probably also not producing a uh, good product. Now, the other side of diversity, uh, which I think is actually even more important is inclusion. So diversity just means we have lots of different people in the room, but we still only listen to some, right? Inclusion is where we listen to all of them uh, and give them all the same chance. So organizational efforts and practices in which different groups or individuals having different backgrounds or culturally and socially, ex are cu culturally and socially accepted and welcomed and equally treated. Um, so diversity without inclusion really means nothing because it just means you put in some puppets um, and you have nice photos that you can put your websites, but in reality, you have changed nothing to the specific people. Um, so uh, you could also say diversity means choice in theory, inclusion means choice in practice. Um, another uh, way to say it is diversity is being invited to the party, uh, inclusion is being invited to dance. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is social privilege. Um, and this is, uh, I think, to many people in, or let's say, white male of, you know, around 30 years of age has become a sort of a trigger word for many. Um, and privilege is anything or any advantage that you have that is completely out of your control. Um, so maybe another thing, as I was talking to Geoffroy, the fact that you all can come here and use the bathroom, that's actually privilege because people in a wheelchair cannot use these bathrooms, right? So that's an example. You did nothing uh, to be able to use those bathrooms and the people in wheelchairs did nothing to not be able to use them, but still they cannot, right? Um, so um, again, maybe uh, to talk about personally, um, so my career has very much been founded on the fact that I've become quite known in the open source community. Um, and I actually did work very hard on that. Um, but I got into open source by starting my first company. Um, and we were using open source stuff. Now, how could I uh, be able to start that company? So basically, I earned the initial capital. I was still living in Berlin at that time by working for my uncle in Switzerland um, 
and uh, in the summer. So that was my initial capital. And still, like in the beginning, we weren't earning much, but my parents had made sure that I had a very cheap apartment I could live in. And also, I knew if we would ever go broke, my parents would take care of me, right? So that's privilege. So getting, doing that work in the open source community, that was hard work. Starting my company was hard work. But somebody that did, would not have that financial network around them could have been just as motivated to do the same work, just as capable to do the same work, and even more and not achieve what I achieved. So what I want to say is that with privilege, and we're not talking about um, that it diminishes what people do that have that privilege. It just means that we need to realize that some people have the same motivation, capabilities, and don't get to that point. So if, you know, if we look at uh, some people not achieving as much, uh, we need to realize that maybe they were prevented uh, by things that I didn't have to go through. Um, so the next word I want to um, explain is equity. And um, so it's not the same as equal. Um, because, and this relates again to privilege, um, because not everybody has to overcome the same obstacles uh, treating somebody equal. Like, for example, we could say people in wheelchairs were equally invited to attend here, right? But it was not equitable because we didn't make sure that we had a sufficiently modified uh, bathroom that we could comfortably have them here or that they would be comfortable being here, right? So equity really means that we take that effort to really enable people to also participate um, um, and not just say, okay, well, you all had the same opportunity. Um, by the way, if I explain things and you're unsure, just interrupt me also, I'm fine. All right, so with that definition out of the way, I want to challenge you all. Think of a number of the number. Just think of a number. And uh, so there are about 15% of programmers in Switzerland are female. Now, let's think about what is the number in the US. So it's about 20%. Um, so it's definitely better. I would say that there are maybe a couple reasons. Uh, one is I think the US or the Anglo-Saxon world is started on the topic of diversity much earlier. Um, but either way, the number is kind of weird uh, because my father actually is also a programmer. He was taught by two women uh, because at the time when he started coding, and that was in the 70s, most programmers were women, right? So we went from most women, uh, most programmers being women to 15 to 20 percent. Um, and there's, um, actually I don't have it in this slide, there's, there's quite a bit of history around this and this is also around privilege. For example, the ability to buy a personal computer was limited to men at the time when personal computers came about. So basically the personal computer was the reason why this shift happened. Um, now, uh, again, I'm an open source programmer. Um, we have open in the word, um, so we should be welcoming. So how many uh, female open source programmers do we have? Think of a number. So it's two to 10%. Um, there are different studies. Um, it also depends on the community. So open source is less diverse on the gender spectrum than the proprietary world. Right, so that's, I don't know, I thought that it was really shocking when I realized it. And I think it has a lot to do with the fact that in the open source world, we, we weren't forced to care, right? So in the, in the proprietary world, there has been some pressure on them from politics and things like that, uh, which doesn't exist in the open source world. And so we could afford to not care. Now, another thing that many people say with open so with regard to these numbers with open source is that, well, women are apparently just not motivated to do open source work. And um, that's of course, I would say a bullshit argument. Um, there, there are some other reasons why this is the privilege is another good example. I mentioned that I got into open source because I had, um, you know, I could afford to do work for free. 
um, women are on average much more likely to be primary takers of either children or elderly people. So they don't have that much time. They also don't have that many, that much uh, socioeconomic freedom as men enjoy. So this is probably the more uh, important reason. But another reason is maybe this. So there was a study um, uh, that looked at how often pull requests are being accepted for men and for women. And um, it turned out that um, pull requests for women are rejected more often than for men. So again, you could have the argument, well, maybe they're just not as competent. But what was interesting is that the study went a little bit further and they found that quite a lot of women on the internet hide their gender. So they use a fake name or they use a fake avatar so that people cannot deduce that they are women. And what turned out is that actually then for these people, uh, the acceptance rate is actually slightly higher than for men. So that takes a lot of the argument about competence out of the game and really shows that it's just sexism, right? So if you're a woman and you hide your, the fact that you're a woman on the internet, suddenly you're being treated fairly. Whereas if you expose yourself as a woman, you're not being treated fairly and equally anymore, right? So it's not about competence, it's just sexism. Um, so, and I've seen this a lot as well. So if we're talking about like, we see a, a programming bootcamp just for women, or we see some other uh, award just for women or things like that, then we see, ah, okay, so women are being treated better than men, they have more opportunities. And I would say, given all these problems that I just talked about, these are just attempts at creating equity, right? So they're just trying to give some new platforms for women so that they have equal opportunity to succeed, right? Um, and this, by the way, uh, I didn't mention, I, I should have mentioned this at the beginning of the talk. In the examples, I often talk about the gender dimension of women and, and, and men here, um, or people that are somewhere on the gender spectrum. Um, and this is mostly because it's just a very well-researched uh, area. And also, it's a very good example because we all know women, right? We all know men. Um, we might not be exposed to some of the other uh, dimensions that are relevant in diversity. So I don't know how many people of you actually interact with people that are in wheelchairs, right? Or have ever in your life. Um, so, it, it, so that's why I'm using the, the you know, gender example more in this talk, not because it's more relevant per se, but just because it, I, I think it's, it's probably going to be more, uh, more easy to understand uh, what the problems are. So this is a, is a good example in a way. Uh, so here we have uh, so the, sort of the inside track. So this is the, you know, the women that get these additional opportunities, additional award opportunities where they can present themselves. But fundamentally, these are not, they don't, this doesn't make them faster because they have all these other obstacles that are preventing them from being faster. Even though they have the inside track. <coughs> and this gets me to a very, very important topic, um, and this is the unconscious cognitive bias. And this is one of the key things that are keeping, th uh, or that are preventing change from happening. Um, so basically, cognitive biases are when we as humans, um, instead of you know, objectively looking at reality, we use mental shortcuts um, to come to conclusions which we still then think are based in rational thinking. Um, so these are really like, yeah, mental shortcuts and just really trying to help us. I think from an evolutionary point of view, they just made reality a little bit simpler. They made also group uh, harmony a little bit th uh, simpler, but they don't really help us with thinking innovative, uh, in like innovative sense. Um, and they don't help us deal with differences a lot, uh, very much. Um, so I think from an evolutionary point of view, it made a lot of sense but I think it, nowadays it's actually becoming a big problem. So um, basically cognitive bias let us jump to suboptimal uh, outcomes um, and um, they just keep us on a safe path. Now, um, 
let's go through some confirmation biases. So for example, one uh, bias is that we, uh, or that it's generally assumed that women are less confident than men. Um, and it turns out that uh, you know, plenty of studies have been done that come to the conclusion women are equally confident. They just show the confidence on average a little bit different. And since we, you know, we basically assume that how men uh, display confidence is how you should display confidence if you are actually confident, we assume that women are not confident. Right, so um, um, so when we see a, a, um, uh, um, uh, just losing my thought a little bit here. Um, so basically, even though a woman might display confidence, because she's not displaying the male type of confidence, we are confirmed that she's not being confident. Now let's look at another one. So gender stereotyping bi uh, biases. Um, and let's maybe uh, read this story. I was typing up notes from one of our scientists when I got a call from my nanny who was at the doctor. Upset, I rushed home and to be there before the kids I got home from school. Now think about the genders of the nanny and the doctor. Like if you, in your head, think about what the genders are. Many of you will probably have thought of the nanny as being female and the doctor being male, right? So it's just hard for us to imagine this, right? Um, and it means two things. I mean, this and, and you know, uh, these biases, they affect women just as much, right? So if they are socialized in a way to not see themselves as a doctor, but see themselves as a nanny, then they're more likely to do that profession, right? Um, if they are in an interview uh, to become a nanny, or if you're a man and you're interviewed to become a nanny, people will, well, that's weird. Are you a pedophile? You know, why are you a man interested in being a nanny, right? Um, so we have these stereotypes, um, and uh, it's important to be aware of them. Um, let's, another example here. So we have Ellen and Ben. So Ellen is envious, stubborn, and has a few other. Um, so who would you hire? So in fact, they both have the same characteristics, but just the order of how they were presented is different. Um, and we have a tendency that if we get Ben, um, you know, and the first thing somebody tells us that Ben is intelligent, and then somebody tells him he's industrious, but he's also impulsive, critical, stubborn, and envious, then we tend to forgive sort of the problematic characteristics because we already gave them the halo, the, the angel above their head, right? Whereas if we first have this person presented as with negative characteristics, then we'll probably see the positive characteristics as smaller. <coughs> so these are just a couple of biases. There are um, many more. Um, these are some of the ones that most affect hiring. So confirmation bias, we seek to confirm what we already assume of that person. Um, gender stereotyping, we basically gender everything. All professions are gendered, uh, tasks are gendered. Um, and it, it's very hard for us to see somebody of a different gender than performing these uh, uh, jobs. Um, the first impression overshadows and sometimes the first impression again, is already associated with the picture um, that they send. Um, and uh, affirmation bias is that we prefer people that are like us. So if you're a company that is already full of men, you're probably going to hire more men just because you can relate to that. More. Um, and then intergroup bias is uh, basically looking for the cultural fit. Um, so again, you're looking for people that you want to drink a beer with. Um, and that's, you know, Leap has done this for a long time. I, I hope we're sol slowly evolving from this because if you want uh, a company that is, uh, you know, be able to innovate, you shouldn't hire people that are like you. You should add people to the company that are different than you because only with difference, you can actually expand your horizon, your ability to innovate. So this is really a key aspect and this is a, an interesting 
relation between unconscious bias and diversity is that unconscious bias hinders diversity and inclusion. It also hinders innovation. Now what is even more interesting is that if you have more diversity and inclusion, it sort of inoculates you to an unconscious bias because you are on a daily basis exposed to differenceness and you differenceness. So personally, I had this experience. I went to the US and only when I was in the US and I saw how different the US was to Germany, I, I started to understand what is actually specific about Germans and what I actually, you know, I, many things I didn't even consider if I like them or dis don't like them. I just assumed that they're given, right? So only when I was exposed to differenceness, I started to contemplate what I like about being German and what I don't like about being German and actually being able to choose which characteristics I, I actually want to have. But at the same time, um, dealing with unconscious bias, also dealing with diversity is not about harmony, right? So it's not about just hugging all, the, all day. Um, diversity and this difference is actually a challenge. This is something that can make, you know, work harder. But this, exactly this challenge is, is what work is about. It's about innovating, uh, about creating something, because everything that is trivial, machines will probably be doing pretty soon, right? So what Margaret is trying to say with this tweet um, is that basically, um, being uncomfortable is a good thing. This is a place where you progress. The key thing that we need to make sure is that in companies is that while you should be, uh, feel, be uh, sort of uncomf being uncomfortable is probably the default state you should be in, it, you should be able to also go back to a comfortable state where you, know, you just relax for a moment and you recharge your batteries until you go back to that uncomfortable state where you actively deal with differences where you face the complexity of reality. Okay, so in this first part, I tried to convince you that diversity and inclusion are important, um, that actually diversity and inclusion also require effort and willingness to change. Uh, in this next section, I wanna give you some concrete ways to actually get there. Um, and maybe as a challenge, pick one, or if you wanna be bold, pick two as I present them that you actually are going to try to implement for the next month or so. So there's, um, this one would be like going all in. Um, so this is actually a, a chart that has a lot of different topics uh, to go into. Um, so this is, and, and there, are, there are a lot of charts like this that, that summarize uh, efforts that can be taken. So here, for example, conferencer, I speak, attend only at conferences that have a code of conduct. Um, because again, as a white man, most likely you're pretty safe. As a woman, most likely you're not. Um, and so with a code of conduct, there at least is this clear, um, clear way uh, to deal with problems um, so that if you attend the conference, that you know that um, actions will be taken if your safety is, uh, you know, is jeopardized by an attendance. So this would, um, so this here is a, so if you want to go all in, this is uh, the, the slide for you. Now the other thing is just, just educating on a topic. Essentially, you're doing this by attending this talk. Um, so that's a good first step, um, but continue on that path. Um, and this is something also, um, when I started getting into this topic, my first thought was, okay, let's walk up to some of my coworker, female programmers that are working at Leap and ask them, right? It's not their job to educate me. It's their job is to be, uh, you know, an employee at Leap and doing the work as an engineer, right? Um, if I ask them to spend their time to educate me, I'm basically, um, uh, putting them in position where they're not being able to do their job anymore because they're spending their time educating me. The information is out there on the internet, so just take that effort. Um, then, um, for, I, I've done this on Twitter. Um, so usually when I see a, a, an interesting tweet from somebody, I don't immediately follow that person. 
Um, usually if I see a couple tweets and I start following in. Um, but in general, my Twitter feed doesn't pop up. I don't have that many men or people of color and so on in my uh, Twitter timeline. So basically, I've reduced my threshold. If I see an interesting tweet from a woman, I'll immediately follow, right? And I can still unfollow if, you know, the next 50 tweets are, are uninteresting for me, but, you know, just getting out of my bubble a bit. Um, challenge cognitive biases. Educating yourself on cognitive biases doesn't mean that you're automatically uh, protected from cognitive bias. Actually, there is one bias that we all think that everybody else is more biased than you are yourself. Um, so educating yourself about biases sometimes even leads to the situation that you become even more biased because you now think, I know it all. Um, so this is something where you actually actively need to challenge yourself. And there are some techniques you can do this. For example, if you made a decision um, and you want to check if it actually is biased, sometimes it's just easy for you write that decision down and you have somebody else read out that decision and pretend like they made that decision. And sometimes even that small trick can get you to the point where you actually are able to more, uh, uh, you know, uh, more clearly look at if this is biased or not. Um, there are cognitive bias trainings. We had some at LEAP. There are some, um, and these were offered by people that are professionalized and specialized in this. So these are things that you can basically get. And I definitely recommend this also to for, you know, go back to your employer and encourage them to invest in something like this. Um, another thing is that, um, again, like, you know, sexism, um, again, I didn't believe that sexism was so prevalent, uh, you know, still so much all around us. I, I knew it existed, but I didn't know how bad it was until I heard from my wife. Now, of course, I could have just said in that moment, yeah, but, you know, this didn't happen to me. So, I don't know, I never heard somebody say something sexist to a woman while I was standing next to them. And yeah, maybe I, d I don't hear it because maybe some like, especially that one moment where she was told that she, c she cannot get that job because she's not a man. Well, in that moment, she was in a room alone with that guy, right? Um, and maybe that's why he felt safe to say it that way. Um, so if people from marginalized communities point out problems, then maybe uh, when in doubt, trust them rather than second guessing them because you didn't witness it yourself. Um, at hiring people, don't just look at uh, how they do things that you already do, look at what they add to the company, new skills, new ideas that they bring to your team. Um, another th practical thing um, to look at uh, in job ads is um, leave out optional items. So we have a tendency in job ads to write in, you know, uh, maybe we have three hard criteria, and then we write in seven more of nice to have. The thing is, if you're part of a marginalized community, you already know that your ch chances are lower getting hired to begin with. So if you see lots of optional items and you don't have all of them in your skill set, you're going to say, well, okay, so not only are my chances lower to begin with, but I don't have all the optional items, so I might as well not apply. Whereas people from the dominant group, they tend to basically see, okay, of those 10 items, I cover three, awesome, I'm a great fit, right? So basically, by leaving out the optional items, you make sure that you filter less uh, people, uh, you, you filter out less people from marginalized communities that you then don't even get to see uh, in interviews. Um, use inclusive language in job ads, actually, um, maybe as a, a small commercial plug, that's one of the first tools that we built at WittyWorks. We have a tool that where you basically can write your job ad and as you type, it gives you instant feedback about problematic uh, phrasing structures um, with explanations so that you can immediately change the language. And we've seen some of our customers use this. So for example, a big in, um, uh, insurance company is one of our first customers. They've done this for six months and they have 40% more applicants um, that are female. Um, yeah, uh, declare your preferred pronouns. And this is something, so for example, I go by he, him. And by declaring that I go by he, him, I normalize the idea of declaring your pronoun. So people that are not binary or that don't see themselves as binary on the gender spectrum or where it's not uh, immediately obvious um, from you know, what we've become accustomed to, how a man or woman look like, um, they, will also potentially declare their pronouns, but 
if only they do it, it is a weird thing. If we all do it, it becomes normal. <coughs> so basically my Twitter profile and Slack and so on, um, I try to sort of uh, communicate my pronouns just to normalize this. Another thing is throttle yourself in discussion. Um, so if people of, from marginalized communities are in the room, there are, they've, they've been sort of trained in a way that their opinion will matter less, right? So they also will choose to speak up much more rarely, right? So if you throttle yourself, you might notice that actually they do have something to say if you leave space in the room so that they can talk. <coughs> and this is a big problem with me. I like to talk, so I fill up the room a lot. So this is a challenge that I continuously give myself to just speak less. Um, and this is something I said in the be very beginning. If somebody points out that you've done something offensive, just listen, learn, move on. You don't need to explain yourself in that moment. You're not going to make the world better by explaining yourself, um, especially if you're in a position of privilege. Accept the fact that this person criticized you. You don't need to fix your ego in that moment by explaining how you made that accidental offensive statement. Um, and um, yeah, another thing is make sure that uh, contributions are recognized. Um, and this is something I, I didn't realize until I had a, a female colleague and it actually, she, she, she annoyed me a bit because she kept pointing out what she did. And, um, and I, I talked to her about it and she said, well, otherwise it just gets forgotten, right? And, and then, you know, she really challenged me on that and I started looking for this and I realized that it actually is like really happening. Like if, if a woman, or, uh, you know, was doing something, it was the team. And if this guy did it, he was the superhero. Uh, and it's really just a weird pattern. Uh, and I, it was totally shocking. Um, and yeah, and that's why she was doing it. She needed to point it out because otherwise it would be forgotten. Um, and this is a term, is it safe enough to try? This is something, uh, a terminology we use at LEAP quite a bit. Um, and this comes from the holacracy world of self-management. Uh, I don't wanna get into that. But basically, oftentimes when we are faced with somebody doing something different, um, our first reaction is, um, no, we need to stop this. And this is really part of this, you know, we, we want to run on the safe lane and we want, to, want everything to divide in the same way. So again, if we hire, we're going to ask them some questions to see, okay, in that moment, how would you react? Okay, it's different than I would. Ah, that sounds risky, right? Um, but if you think about this and it's safe enough to try, like what really is the, the risk of doing it differently, right? Um, so if it's, if it's green or orange, you think it should be green, but orange, is it really such a big risk to have something orange? So think about it that way. Sometimes if people wanna do something differently, just think what is the worst thing that could happen and then just let it happen, even if it's a little bit different than what you are accustomed to. All right, so I'm at the end. I think I went a little bit longer than I wanted to. Uh, but the key takeaways, um, diversity helps us understand the customer. So it really is good business. Cognitive biases help hurt innovation and diversity helps us overcome cognitive bias. Therefore, diverse teams are actually more innovative. Um, when faced with criticism, listen, learn, move on. Um, there are many things uh, we can do and we sh need to do, and we need to be active on this. We can't just lean back and just be a nice person and think that we actually um, are solving anything. Um, by not being active, we actually pause a problem. Um, but all of this requires effort and willingness to invest. Um, yeah, so this is shortly the plug. Um, so this is the tool we build. So basically, it just highlights stuff and when you click on it, um, or you, you move your cursor there, then you are presented with some information about how to um, change the wording, the reasoning, and how to solve it. Um, um, we have a free trial where you can try this out at Diversity Diversifier Wikiworks. Um, but yeah, hiring is only part of the thing. We also need to make sure that people stay uh, within the companies. Um, I think that's actually maybe the closing word in a way that oftentimes when we talk about lack of diversity, one of the excuses are being given is that there's a 
there's no pipeline, right? The people are just not coming in. Um, and if we would just retain people of diverse backgrounds, we would be in a much, much better place. So at LEAP, um, we don't have that many female programmers, but of all the people that left LEAP, I can name two people that left the IT industry, like that were programmers and stopped being programmers, and these two were women, right? And even though the percentage of women at LEAP that are programming is always so low, the only two examples I can give are two, right? And these two were women. Um, so if we can basically retain, we would already be much better, right? Um, and the pipeline, again, with this tool we've shown to companies, they can get 40% more women applying if they just phrase their job ads in a way that actually is inviting to women. So even the pipeline is not a reason why diversity is not a reality. All right, I'm done. Mm -hmm.